There we are. We're in part five now of special senses, and we're reviewing just that last bit of um, the uh, sensation of smell, page 567 here. And um, do you recall that we were working on this information down here about how um, we're able to stimulate the glomeruli very, very specifically, and... Um, the glomeruli pick up information from only certain um, uh, types of uh, notes of, of the uh, possibilities here of smell. And that, the, um, that we have the two pathways. One pathway goes to the piriformis lobe, which is the actual conscious cortex portion, it says here. And... Um, it says that uh, of the olfactory cortex, one passageway brings information to part of the frontal lobe. Frontal lobe is where we actually, shall we say, compli uh, calculate complex consideration of the world. It's our thinking area, the frontal lobe there, above the orbit of the eye, where smells are consciously interpreted and identified. So we get an ID and says that only some of this information passes through the thalamus. So the thalamus is going to, um, as you know from last semester, make a value judgment. Is this good or bad information? So sometimes smell is going to trigger us to let us know, oh, this is a dangerous thing or a good thing, uh, possibly based on history. We had a bad or a good experience with this smell. Um, but ultimately, it's also going to trigger emotion because there's a subcortical pathway that goes to the... Um, hypothalamus, the amygdala, and other parts of the limbic system. And uh, so this is the emotional content, the emotional response of smells. And so we have um, such things as uh, colognes and, um, uh, how shall I say, uh, pheromones and that sort of thing, which help us uh, not only identify but also bond to or reject or in some ways uh, feel a certain kind of richness or even a certain kind of horror if we smell something that's considered bad. So um, there are lots of emotional content to that. Okay, then we're over on page um, uh, 568 and we're taking a look at taste here. Taste is part of our consideration. There are three cranial nerves involved in taste. Uh, the anterior two-thirds of the tongue is going to be operated by cranial nerve 7, the facial nerve. There's a posterior one-third, or maybe less than one-third, that's uh, taken care of by cranial nerve number 9. There's bitter back here, by the way. There's uh, salt and uh, sour and sweet up here. Bitter is back here. And um, then we have cranial number, uh, number 9, the glossopharyngeal, taking care of some of these really big uh, units here, these big taste buds. Number 10 is usually far back on the tongue after you've swallowed or it's on the roof of the mouth. The palate also has uh, innervation by number 10 and it has taste buds right on the roof of the palate. You know, when your uh, peanut butter gets stuck on the roof of the palate, then uh, you're using cranial nerve number nine, uh, number 10 rather, the vagus. Vagus, glossopharyngeal, and then facial. Okay, and then we take a look here at the various uh, types of um, of little buds here, taste buds um, on these various things. We have taste buds on uh, the fungiform uh, papillae, which are numerous. Uh, on the foliate papillae, we have lots of, and this is especially uh, significant in childhood. And uh, didn't you always suspect when you were four or five years old that you were different from the adults? And in fact, is you were. Uh, you had more going on over here because this is always involved in sweet uh, and not not uh, not so much the bitter. So children really don't like bitter and they really enjoy sweet. Um, at any rate, um, maybe you commiserated with your, your fellow uh, five-year-olds from time to time on this topic. Okay, then um, we have filiform papillae, which have no taste buds on them at all. And uh, this is mainly for friction. Our uh, friction-oriented filiform papillae are not that significant. 
Uh, since cats, uh, for instance, do not drink from a teacup uh, and they have to lap up everything, then their uh, filiform papillae are really quite vivid and it's like sandpaper on their tongues. Here's a taste bud now. Um, and you can see here that the taste bud has uh, areas. This is a very large one. This is one of the circumvallate. Uh, they call it a vallate, but uh, historically we actually call it a circumvallate because it's like a circle. And uh, it's got a little crypt over here. Uh, and the taste buds are actually right on the side of the papillae. If you look really closely, I don't know if we can get a close up here. Oh, there it is now. Okay, so you can actually see that we have kind of like hair cells sticking out uh, into the crypt here. Um, so that's what's going on. And that uh, there's fluid portions dipping down in there. Okay, so um, over here we have another example where there's an opening, a taste pore. It goes in, it associates with the epithelial cell. We have a stimulus, we have a transduction of that taste event. Let's take a look over here at the taste events. Okay, so um, here we have some bullets, uh, some red bullets over here on page um, uh, 569 that indicate that we're considering such things as sweet tastes. And that's um, a molecule that should be uh, in the shape of a glucose molecule. You know, it's glucose are um, ring molecules. But there's other uh, things that can... Um, how shall I say, uh, be in sort of a charade or a uh, mimicking the glucose molecule. So there are other things. Uh, saccharin, not a very good example. Um, certain alcohols can have a sweetness to them. Certain amino acids, especially when they're put together as a dipeptide, uh, we have our aspartame, which is exactly the size of a glucose molecule and fits right in there. Unfortunately, we have the um, oxides of lead that could be found in lead paint, and uh, that unfortunately is sweet, and so um, farm animals would often lick the lead paint from various surfaces, and then of course our children historically would also be intrigued by the taste of the windowsill if it was painted with, wet, uh, with the, the lead paint, so we've had to stop using that. Sour is all about hydrogen ion. It's a, a kind of um, acidity. So things like, um, uh, let's see what they're talking about here. The uh, lemon juice, of course, you know, grapefruit juice and um, things like vinegar, that sort of thing. Salty, salty has a variety of possibilities, mostly taken up by sodium. So sodium is the main stimulant, stimulant of uh, of the salty flavor, although uh, potassium could play a role in that. Generally, it doesn't so much. Then we have bitter. Bitter is unique, um, pretty much in our uh, a lot of our environment, unless you like bitter melon. We do have caffeine. Uh, it turns out chocolate that's unsweetened is certainly bitter, uh, and so we have a number of things that can fit the category of bitter. And then we have um, uh, a taste, a fifth taste called umami, and in English, we don't have anything for that. Um, but the direct translation from Japanese for this is delicious. But it's a savory kind of a taste. And it's to be found when um, you're cooking with things like meats or mushrooms. Or um, they talk here about the aging of cheeses. So um, a lot of times when you've uh, cooked something into a broth and you've used um, portions and parts of uh, vegetable uh, peelings or roots and things like that that have cooked for a long time, eventually they reveal, they release their savoriness and one develops umami. Okay, so that's that uh, type of thing. Now these are the only five tastes actually and they do make a, a reference here uh, to the idea of flavor which um, Let's take a look here. Can this get into better focus? There it is. And so they describe it as 80% smell, real flavor. Okay, so if you're holding your nose or if you have a cold, uh, it turns out the food doesn't taste all that good, but that's because flavor, the flavor component, is made up of the aromatics. 
that rise uh, up as one is savoring the food. Okay, and so that's the idea here that you need to have something um, that adds to the five flavors, namely scent, will be that particular item. Okay.